Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of This Is Hate CD. My name is Jerry Scullion and I'm your host and I'm sure you know by now I'm based in the beautiful city of Dublin, Ireland and the sun is out today. Hooray! Now today in the show we have an absolutely incredible treat for you. Let me tell you a bit of a background, okay? So when I'm travelling or when I lived in Australia, say, and I get asked where I'm from, I say I'm from Ireland. When I'm in Ireland, I say I live in Dublin, but I'm from a place called Drogheda. But when I'm in Drogheda and I tell them where I'm from, I tell them where I grew up. Well, the location is not only the place of my birth, but it's really, really historic. It's on the banks of the River Boyne, a hugely historic location in Irish history for various reasons. But this river is known internationally really as the Brune the Boyne, which refers to the mansion or the palace of the Boyne. And from the ages of about eight or nine, I remember going on a school tour and I became somewhat obsessed with this area of the river because on the bend of that river is a Neolithic tomb that predates the pyramids and is approximately 3,200 years old before Christ. Now, it's a World Heritage Site and it's quite simply a remarkable and a spiritual location for me particularly that I believe offers us a really rich connection to the past. In this episode, I speak with Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. Now, Anthony is also from where I'm from in Drogheda and offers, and over, I guess over the last 30 or so uh, years, has really explored the surrounding areas of Newgrange and has become a well of knowledge about that area. Together with local artist Richard Moore, who coincidentally was instrumental in encouraging me as a teenager to pursue my love of design, well, they've explored and uncovered knowledge that really offers us new perspectives into what it might have been like at the time of Newgrange. Now, of course, a lot of this is speculation, but we discuss nevertheless what we believe we do know. There's an unbelievable revelations for me in this conversation about things like how they transported these huge boulders, these huge rocks that they've got engravings on. But they're from over 120 kilometers away from the site of Newgrange. How do they do that? We also discuss how they would have been traveling back and forth from the UK and much, much more using boats. Now, I'm keen to learn more about the potential of the social structures at that time to try and get a peek what it was like. And Anthony was 100% happy for me to get a clearer picture of what that might have looked like at the time. So from a human centered design perspective, I'm really curious what we can learn and derive from the Neolithic period and where we are today. Let's jump straight in. Um, Anthony, I'm delighted to have you here on This Is Hate City. I've been uh, a big fan of your work and I used to watch it when I was away in Australia on, on YouTube. I'm delighted to have you here. But for our listeners, maybe we'll start off uh, by telling them a little bit about yourself, where you're from. And I, I know it's going to be a difficult one, but what you do. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm from Drada, which is the... Where I'm from. Yeah which is where you're from, which is very shortly going to become Ireland's next city. I'm, yeah. I'm fully convinced of it. Um, a very large town that serves as something of a gateway to the ancient Boyne Valley. And yeah. I'm very lucky that we live very close to all these very, very amazing places. Um, born in the 70s, raised here in a town in a country that was struggling economically. Um, didn't know what the hell was going to happen. Uh, got a job in the newspaper because my father was the editor there. And he said, you know, here's an opportunity. I was reluctant. Uh, I just wanted to be a writer. Um, ended up working in newspapers for 30 years. Right. Uh, but um, in 1999, which is just over 25 years ago, I met Richard Moore, who's a local artist here in Drogheda. And mm. uh, he just transformed the way I was kind of uh, looking at the landscape and um, he told me some of the myths and legends which I didn't know and we began uh, an epic journey together which culminated yeah. in a book island of the setting sun and I've been writing books and talking about all this stuff ever since uh, yeah. as time goes on it, it doesn't wane or doesn't lose energy it just gets more and more interesting for me and more curious got married uh, 20 over 25 years ago, have five kids, four of them are now adults, uh, still live in Drada, love yeah. the place, love Ireland, love the place. Absolutely. Love, love my homeland, you know. Um, it's it's really great to see, like, it's great to hear as well, because 
you know, when I was away and I was looking at, um, you know, a lot of the videos, I was learning more and more about it. And there was, when I was growing up, you mentioned Richard Moore there as well. And I want to give a shout out to Richard because I grew up very close to Richard. Like I'm, I'm talking about a couple of hundred meters away from his house. And he was the established artist in the town. Like he was the, you know, the, the guy who's done it. Like, you know, he, he, he's selling the paintings and stuff. And they're amazing stuff. His work, I always remember, was was really, really beautiful. But he gave me a lot of advice to get my design portfolio ready. Um, and that's kind of what set me on my way once I went got into university and you know, studied design and stuff. So he was really the seedling um, that allowed me to to kind of get into my career and so forth. Like, you know, but it's it's amazing to think that we've both we share that kind of seedling together, like, you know, because collaborating with people is at the the center of what we teach at and we talk about and this is hate city we're all talking about change makers so it sounds like you've gone through a period of immense change from working um and collaborating with richard and finding an awful lot about our native uh kind of the area especially around the bruna boyne are you okay to talk about a specific area because i remember reading a blog post that you you wrote I don't know when you wrote the blog post, but I've just, just found out it was from the late 90s uh, yeah. when you found this. Can we talk about the Baltray discovery? Because I think oh, that's yeah. just a remarkable story. Well, that was, well, Baltray was really what set in motion, I yeah. think, much of what was to follow. Hmm. Um, it was one thing to be tramping around the fields looking at stones and to be reading books and, you know, archaeological books and mythological books. It was an entirely different thing to be making some sort of significant contribution in terms of a discovery. Baltray yeah. was amazing because first of all, the Baltray standing stones are located in a field close to the village of Baltray, which is a coastal village. For those of you who don't know it, it's a village near the coast where the River Boyne enters the sea, mm. about five miles east of where I'm sitting here. And uh, so uh, first of all, a lot of people didn't even know those stones were there. Yeah, um, I didn't. And, and Richard Moore has this uncanny habit of finding places that nobody knows about. Uh, he just yeah. happens to enter fields or walk into a forest or, you know, walk along the edge of a, a, a stream a or a, a river and find stuff that no, apparently nobody else has noticed. Anyway, yeah. so he took me there in May of 1999 and we were looking. Michael Byrne, who was an astronomer friend of Richard's and who, believe it or not, had worked for a short time in the Drogheda Independent in the 1980s. This is right. when I was a kid, and I remember yeah. meeting him because he had taken photographs of Halley's Comet in 1986. Well, Michael Bourne had been with Richard and had discovered that if you put your binoculars against the sort of long edge of this big stone, the larger of the two stones, he put his binoculars and he could see Rockabill, the islands out off the coast uh, through the view. And so when I arrived and they told me this, I was, I just sort of intuitive, instinctively, <laughs> the astronomer in me is always looking at these things. I was like, that looks like it could be winter solstice sunrise, lads. <laughs> and their answer was, ah, no, the sun doesn't, definitely doesn't go down that far, you know, because what people forget in Ireland is the the angular distance between summer sunrise in mid-June or 21st of June and 21st of December, the angle is actually almost 90 degrees. Uh -huh. It, it's an incredible distance of travel along the horizon. Uh, so I said, oh, I think it does. So then Richard used to have this ship's compass. Uh, don't know where he got it. I don't know if it's a thing that his father had or whatever, but it was a very large compass in a, in a sort of metal casing. And we used to haul this around to take measurements because it was going to be a lot more accurate than your handheld compass. Um, so we took a measurement. And the thing about magnetic readings versus true is that you have to consult your ordnance survey map which will give you the differential which i think back then was about 7.8 degrees so you had to take 7.8 degrees off anyway i think we calculated it was around 130 degrees of azimuth maybe 131 and i said i'm pretty sure that's winter solstice anyway we weren't going to be able to find out until december and yeah. richard and michael went to baltray i went to newgrange um, they were sort of dispatched to Baltray to make the observation. And the sun was rising as they were walking up the field towards the stones. No way. Uh, 
And, and Martin Brennan, when he made his discoveries, he wrote it in his book, uh, The Stars and the Stones, about when they made their discovery at Loch Crew, he felt he was late for an appointment that be, that had been made 5,000 years ago. Um, <laughs> but when, when they arrived at the stones, the sun was just sitting off the, it was sitting on the horizon and almost in line with the islands, but just a couple of sun widths to the left or to the north of where the islands were. Mm. And uh, so uh, later that day, Michael brought his camcorder, showed me footage and I said, yeah, well, if it's two sun widths, that makes sense because there's this <laughs> wobble of very slight wobble of the Earth's axis uh, and we call it obliquity of the ecliptic. Yeah. Uh, and basically the, the Earth's, the, the Earth's angular, the, the, the angle of the Earth's uh, tilt versus the plane of the solar system is wobbles between, I think, 22 degrees and 26 degrees, something like that. Uh, right. I think at the moment it's like 23 and a half degrees. Anyway, this causes the sun's solstice positions basically to oscillate. So um, it was fairly accurate for something that might be about 5,000 years old. Now, the dating of standing stones is generally considered to be uh, Bronze Age, but I think these ones are Neolithic. So that was a discovery and it was like, oh, here we go. Uh, the start of a wonderful adventure, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, another thing about it that was fascinating was there was this distinct distinctive intuitive aspect to it it's like sometimes you have to switch off your scientific brain and let the other side of your brain do a bit of work you know and it's not even that it does work it just but it was a curiosity it just things out you know it was your curiosity there from the story you just told like about you know the assumptions that we made that the sun didn't go down that far but then you're like actually no we're gonna try it like you know and you experimented and you know you found out and you kind of questioned the assumption which is a strong thing to do in especially within design but i guess like just looking at that as an example um of a discovery that you found the bits that i'm really interested in for change makers generally who are kind of trying to make the world a better place what can we learn from way back to those periods of time in terms of how you know civilizations were structured what did it look like in terms of, um, you know, the, the spiritual beliefs and rituals that they ha held at that time? So there's probably two questions in there. Like, you know, probably first of all, why was the sun so important to them other than the obvious of like sources of heat and potential for growing food and stuff? Well, what was the spiritual benefit or the spiritual kind of beliefs at that time related to the sun? The spiritual beliefs of the Neolithic, I think we can only sort of surmise or, or guess at. Yeah, there's nothing written down. I mean, we've not we've nothing written down about uh, Ireland. Uh, you can't but, Google this stuff, lads. No, I mean the monks, the Christian, the ecclesiastical yeah. scribes began writing in the sixth, seventh centuries. So we have nothing. I think we can sort of guess a certain amount. Um, with the caveat that we can never know for sure. Well, first and foremost, of course, the obvious thing is that these people were farmers. They were uh, people who had brought uh, cattle and sheep uh, into Ireland uh, mm. and pigs um, because before that we only had wild boar. So, mm. And they also brought crop husbandry with them. So before that, we didn't sow crops and we didn't, uh, we, we didn't keep animals for milk and for meat. Um, we were hunter gatherers before we, I say we, as if, you know, I'm, I'm talking on, uh, when I say we, you know, I mean the Irish people since the year dot. Yeah. Uh, so there's that, I mean, in Ireland, of course, we know about the ca capricious. Yeah. Go ahead. That's all good. I, I dog, understand. The dog is, the dog uh, is trying uh, to chime he, in. He's, he's like, yeah. I know the answer. Um, in, in, in the Neolithic, um, what was I going to say now? They're totally distracted by that drug bar. Yeah, it's, all, it's all good. You were, I think we were talking about the the Neolithic um, practices. Um, yeah, they brought farming. So uh, farmers, all, yeah. Yeah, we, we know in Ireland about the capricious nature of weather yeah, and how, you know, I mean, it's not just from day to day and from week to week and from month to month. We notice a pattern lately in Irish weather where we're tending to get a drought in the springtime or the early summer. But then, for instance, last summer we had, I think we had a dry June, but we had a terrible 
July with the wettest mm. July on record, I think. Um, I've been keeping an eye, of course, on archaeology during drought seasons to try and capture some pictures. We'll talk about that. Uh, in a minute. You're, you're amazing we've discoveries had, in that. We've had spring droughts and we've had summer droughts, but then we've had these washouts, you know, uh, and you just imagine what would it be like to be a farmer in the Neolithic who hasn't got the access to the scientific knowledge that we've built up over generations, mm. you know, because ag agriculture now is a science. Um, yeah. You know, very few farmers just put, put their finger up at, and, and see what way the wind is blowing. Farming is very, very well thought out and planned. Um, mm. And of course, it's very highly regulated now. So there's that. But I think beyond that, the sun and the moon and the stars hold this deeper mystery for pre-literate and pre-scientific societies. Now, they were scientific to an extent. They used science to a limited extent. They they were much more attuned, I think, to the natural patterns of the year. I mean, we go by the... We have this nonsensical uh, calendar, the Gregorian calendar, mm. which puts New Year's Day on the 1st of January, which as an astronomical date is totally meaningless, you know? Um, so, and, and this idea that some months have 30, some have 31 days and, and one has 28 is bizarre as well. Yeah. That's probably more closely tied to the lunar month. Uh, but even the lunar month is either 27 or 29 days, you know. Um, anyway. So we're, dis we're disconnected to time and, and yeah. know, solar activity. I mean, if you're, in, if you're in the Neolithic, let's just put it this way. You've got no wristwatch. You've got no way of keeping time um, other than nature. And nature shows you everything. So they figured out, look, I don't think they figured this out in the Boyne Valley 5,000 years ago. I yeah. think humans knew this since time immemorial. They knew that at, at the further north you go, the further the swing between summer and winter. So yeah. for instance, inside the Arctic Circle, in summer, the sun never sets. In yeah. winter, it never rises. But mm -hmm. as you get, as you move closer to the equator, the angle between summer and winter gets closer. Yeah. So uh, at these latitudes, it's not difficult to notice that sort of stuff. And then you're watching, as the seasons progress, you're watching the effects of that. You're watching the effects of, obviously in winter, as the sun retreats down uh, the horizon, it's rising in the south, southeast and setting in the southwest, and it forms a low arc across the sky. The land is seen to die. The fields go barren. And this is the time when you need to have a store of food. Actually, it's a funny thing, but you don't really need a store of food in winter. Um when you need a store of food is actually uh, the six weeks before the harvest in the summer. Right. Uh, when last year's supply is Oops. likely to have run out. Um, yeah. So, so there are very practical reasons that the sun um, is worshipped. But then beyond that, they make a god of the sun. They make a mm. deity of the sun. We see that in the mythology, you know. Did, the did they worship the sun? Like, was it seen as that was the god? Like, did they believe? I think that they had to, they believed they had to propitiate this deity in order to guarantee a supply of food. And so I there think was that, religious and theology. Oh, yeah. And I think some of that is evident in the mythology, actually. Hmm. Uh, if you look at the myth of doubt, for instance, hmm. the story of doubt as it is recorded in the Dinchanicus, which is a collection of myth myths, about why places got their names, why the eminent and important places got their name, how and why they got their names. What's the story? What's the origin story of this place? Yeah. And Dowd's origin story is that there was a king who ruled at a time when there was a, a, a moraine, a disease upon the cattle of Ireland. There was only one bull and seven cows left in the island. And uh, during this famine, which, like, if you think about any mention of, okay, we have to assume that first and foremost, the story is mythological, but perhaps it also has a memory in it of an event. If in early Ireland, there was a disease on the cattle, I mean, I'm just thinking of the modern yeah. uh, situation we had in the year 2000, we had foot and mouth, yeah. which threatened to wipe out the uh, cattle right. and sheep herds of Ireland and Britain. We were very lucky that yeah. there were very tight controls put in place. Um, that, you know, uh, what what happens during this famine? 
what happens is that the king orders all the men of Ireland to come and build a cairn. Well, it's called a tower in the myth, like the Tower of Nimrod. But you can see there that the ecclesiastical scribe is just trying to uh, make the the myth less pagan and more palatable to mm. the, the the Christian Bible, as it were. And uh, he, he, in order to build this monument, the men of Ireland say to the king, we want endless day. Uh, and the king's sister, who's a powerful sorceress or druidess, <laughs> she casts a spell on the sun to make it stand still in the sky so that there'll be endless day. And uh, everything goes fine until lust seizes the king. He... Uh, commits incest with his sister. And as a result of this, the spell is broken and a sudden darkness comes and the men say they're abandoning uh, doubts and that forevermore its name shall be Dua, uh, which is the Irish name of doubts, which means darkness or darkening. Mm -hmm. And in that, I think we see elements of possibly a real event that mm. is it an indication that when things start to go south agriculturally and weather-wise and climate-wise, um, should we build the biggest monuments that Ireland has ever seen to mm. appease the deities? And I think there's an element of that in the doubt myth, you know? Yeah. Nouth, which is a sister or brother to Douth, um, houses Newgrange. So that's correct, isn't it? I've got them right. I always get mixed up between Nouth and Douth. Newgrange is where Nouth is, isn't it? No, Newgrange and Nouth are two different monuments. So know, there's Nouth and Douth. Yeah. So where where is Newgrange? Newgrange is, is part of Douth, is it? No, it's between the two. Between the two, okay. Yeah. Right. So there's three separate and distinct monuments. So Newgrange, Nouth and Douth. Yeah. So there's three different and, ones. And for some reason, so they all compete. For us, they compete in terms of the splendor of them and the size and the nature of them. Um, but despite the fact that Nouth is the largest and the most ornate of the, yeah. the three, Newgrange uh, dominates in the mythology. Yeah. Newgrange has this additional importance, you know. It's like the central, most important monument. Yeah. Um, it is the other the, two, perhaps a little bit less so, you know. The anchor point. Now, for people who don't know what Newgrange is, I'd love to know your description. How would you describe it to, when the, you know, American tourists come over and you provide them with tours and all the wonderful services you provide? Um, before they get out there and they go, what is Newgrange, Anthony? How do you, how do you describe it to them? Um, I think Newgrange is best described. Uh, in wonder. In, well, in two term, two ways. Uh, first, uh, archaeologically and then second, mythologically, you know, mm. uh, and, and also then astronomically. It is a very large stone monument. Uh, archaeologists call it a passage tomb. Mm. It, uh, it's a it's about eighty five meters in diameter. It's a huge cairn, which means it's basically a huge pile of stones. All of those stones collected and gathered and brought to that place by humans, surrounded by a giant ring or belt or curb of stones, ninety seven of them, weighing anywhere between one tons and about eight tons apiece. Wow! Um, uh, and inside it is a passageway leading to a cruciform chamber with a corbelled. Uh, roof in it, uh, where people were buried. But we believe people of great importance mm. in Neolithic society, because there were very few people buried in Newgrange, unlike other passage tombs where we see uh, evidence of communal burial. And uh, it, once a year, well, when I say once a year, in the winter, uh, when the sun retreats far enough down the horizon and it's heading towards that place on the horizon when it's rising and setting, but it's in, in its rising place. It's heading towards that place where it stops at solstice. Mm -hmm. And it, it, in the mornings when it rises, its light shines into the passageway through a special aperture above the doorway yeah. uh, and shines inside the chamber. A, a shaft of light lights up the darkness, this wonderful golden warm sunlight. And it is a thoroughly religious experience even yeah. though we've a tendency to approach Newgrange with a scientific mindset uh, it's very difficult to come away from seeing that as I have done and to not feel that you had actually a religious experience you know mm. that piercing of the darkness it, 
what what it looks like is this this this, this symbol or this phenomenon uh, of hope, you know, of light in the dark, of hang on, sit tight, guys. Yes, we're an agricultural society entirely dependent upon the sun, the weather, the climate. Yeah. Uh, but the sun is turning. It's stopped. We can see that. And as the sun starts to slowly move back up the horizon, it starts to retreat again out of the chamber of Newgrange. And those are the days actually after the standstill of the sun, when mm. the astronomers of the day, the people who built the monument and who were its chief scientific advisors, they're the ones who would have told the, the chief or the king of the day, yep, sun has turned. It's good. It's all good. Yeah. Uh, summer, summer's coming back, you know. So, so there would have been some sort of social structures in place if they were burying the people with the, the perceived, I guess, power or significance in, in their, their community. Is that fair to say? Like if there's, because my understanding of Newgrange was there's three different places within the, the central tomb where they, where they bury those people. Um, do we know any more about what the roles were of those people? Were they, were they holding like guiding structures, like um, holding mayor status amongst the community and what they had to do? Was there control and command happening amongst the community? Are we able to drive any of those kind of insights about what it looked like? I think we can to a degree. So, mm. I mean, anywhere in the world where you see um, ostentatious, large scale. It's huge. Or, monument construction like yeah. Bruna Bonia, you can be pretty sure that somebody's in control. Yeah. You know, you can be pretty sure that there's a hierarchy, a hierarchical society, you know, a stepped society. Uh, so we've always sort of thought about that for a long, long time since probably yeah. since the sixties, since the excavations began yeah. at Newgrange. It's something we've thought about who and how, you know, why would a society build this thing? Not just yeah. this one, but two others. And then, you know, probably two or three dozen satellites, smaller ones. Yeah. You know, um, is this just an egalitarian thing where everybody comes together one day and says, let's build monuments? Or is it somebody's holding power and commanding? And of course, almost exclusively around the world where you see huge architecture, somebody's in, in command. Now, yeah. I believe that we got significant not maybe not the final answer but i think we got significant insights into that in 2020 when a paper was published about dna and the dna in the genetic study of uh prehistoric ireland is revealing things that are <laughs> well they're probably truly shocking some people you know and the big big revelation of 2020 was that one of the men buried in newgrange there were skull fragments found. And this is interesting because mm. just, 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 just as a way of sort of introducing this, in Irish passage tombs, a, a significant portion of people people's bones are cremated. But there's a, also a significant portion that aren't cremated. But everything is fragmented. Um, everything is small fragments, except for we see this tendency, we see it in Sligo, we see it in Bruna Bonia, we see it in Fornox. There's this tendency where there are large skull fragments and this is uncremated material because the cremated bones, unfortunately, don't usually yield DNA. Uh, so anyway, the Lara, Lara Cassidy and her team, uh, uh, Dan Bradley, and a whole coterie of experts, they ran the, gen the genome of this guy and assumed that something was wrong with the software, with the computing power. Uh, it used to be that you could only sequence part of the genome, but we've got supercomputers now. so. Mm -hmm entire genomes can be sequenced. What it was showing was long runs of what's called homozygosity, which basically means in layman's terms, uh, yeah, the same source. Uh, this person, it looked from the initial data, this person was the product of a first degree incestuous union. Uh, and to, to put that in simple terms for your listeners, right. uh, that means this person's parents were likely to have been brother and sister. And if not brother and sister, which is a first degree union, mm. and then the next best thing, the next closest thing is father and daughter or mother and son. So they ran the sequence again 
and came up with the same result. Um, I don't know how shocked people were. Uh, we probably shouldn't be all that shocked. No. Because if that man, he was a man, probably around 40 uh, when he died, or early 40s maybe. If, you know, if you've got... We need to put something straight here. New Grange, the stones, the large stones of New Grange, those weighing between one tons and ten tons, they yeah. all came from Clough Head. They have to have been brought by sea and river, a journey of 31 kilometres in each direction. I was going to ask this. Which yeah, means around yeah. 18 miles, yeah. Um, you've got stones coming from Wicklow, apparently, the White Quartz, if not Wicklow, the Rockabell Islands, which we mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got stones coming from Dundalk Bay. So there's people going incredible distances carrying stones along this. So first of all, as soon as you see that, you, the alarm bells should be ringing. Somebody mm. is dictating this. Somebody's controlling these. So, you know? Someone's asking. So if a guy who's buried in Newgrange, one of only five people buried in Newgrange, uh, if he had first degree incestuous parentage, what does that tell us? It's likely that he was some sort of a dynastic ruler, a god king, who, who's yeah. uh, like the Egyptians, uh, like the Egyptian pharaohs, uh, where, you know, keep it in the family and all of that. But in reality, they probably told people that he was the son of the, the son of the deities. They probably propagated the idea. I'm speculating here. Uh, yeah. so science doesn't tell us this, but uh, they probably propagated the idea that he was the son of the sun god, that he'd been conceived inside Newgrange of a mortal woman uh, with the sun god. Because if you look at some of the myths, you know, and you look at Angus in particular, Angus's conception is quite miraculous, you know. Can, can we just go, like, because for a lot of our listeners, some of this stuff is like, wow, well, what, what's the connection here? And like for, for a long time, my ignorance was, you know, once the Industrial Revolution came along, we were like suddenly smart. You know, what What we can derive from this stuff, especially when you look at Indigenous Australia, when I did some ex exploration and um, that work down there in regards to engineering amongst the Indigenous communities, this stuff goes back 50,000 years. Like, you can find some really powerful information. But when you look at how they move those rocks, you can see that they're either doing some serious manpower in terms of carrying them with large amounts of people or they were used in the proximity of the river to ship these rocks. So it starts to ask the question of like, how advanced was the society and did parts of this civilization just die? Like, well, like I want to understand a little bit more around if you've got any insight to how they moved those rocks. I know a lot of it's speculation probably like in how they did it. That's probably the first question. And then the second question is um, the revolution, what, what their farming techniques, is there anything around that that we can really derive and really kind of play back to our own place in society at the moment? Because to add a third question to the, to the other two, you know, it almost feels like we're at a point in time where we're trying to call back that period of connection to the earth, because when you look at the damage we're doing in terms of uh, creation of products and services and all that, you want to understand what we can derive from, what we can learn from this, this civilization. Um, the f well, the first, first question. The first thing to say about the Neolithic is don't, don't get caught in the trap of imagining that this was an era in which people were in tune with the earth. This is something I used to write about myself mm -hmm. um, in, in, a, in, in, an, in an era before I had the data, you know, yeah. before I had read all the stuff that I've read. So d don't, don't, d d definitely don't get into the idea that the people of Neolithic Ireland were somehow uh, more ecologically uh, friendly or environmentally friendly. Okay. Remember that farming when it arrives here and elsewhere, immediately requires a total change in terms of how you interact with your landscape. So hunter-gatherer mobile societies follow the availability of food as it appears seasonally right. around. Ireland's a small country, so, you know, 
can't imagine following the buffalo across the Great Plains of America like the Native Americans, uh, the tribes. We, we can't imagine, you know, uh, hunting certain animals across the, the Pontic Steppe, for instance, you know, uh, across huge areas of land. Uh, but uh, ne- the Neolithic brings with it a requirement, which is, okay, we need to graze these cattle, but we need to make sure that we're able to get them to take the milk from them. So that requires yeah. putting them in some sort of enclosures or paddocks. Pen. Yeah, you know. Um, and then if you're starting to grow uh, grains, uh, you also have to create fields. So Ireland, until 6,000 years ago, was very heavily forested. Now, yeah. the extent of that, I think, is un- not known. quite clearly known. It has been claimed that... In the Mesolithic, in the, the the age that came before the introduction of farming, that a squirrel wishing to travel the entire length of the island could do so from Mallon Head in the north to Mizzen Head in the south without its feet ever touching the ground. Wow. I, I, I actually doubt that, right. to be honest. Um, but uh, there, you know, uh, there are areas where trees don't grow, hilltops and some mountaintops, and then there's you know, bogs and all of that. Might have had to walk a few hundred feet. (laughs) You know, um, so we had to deforest, you know, the Neolithic farmers had to deforest. um, And it is really, it's been described as the beginning of civilization, the the, the beginnings of Western, Western is probably a bad idea because we see cities everywhere, but it's been described as the beginning of what we, what, what we understand as settled civilization today. So, um, it's, you know, and the, the thing about it is that you, at what point do you become aware that what you're doing is actually counterproductive, you know, uh, removing vast swathes of forestry for agriculture, you know, because even today with all our science and all our knowledge, we don't seem to understand these things. We yeah. just have to look at, South, look at Brazil as an example of that, you know, uh, and look at parts of, is it Java? Um, uh, Borneo, I think Borneo, uh, Borneo, yeah. Uh, where you know, I think there's only 10 20 percent of the entire forest left after yeah. only half a century of deforestation. You know, we're not doing a great job in keeping uh, so the there's that. Um, you know, I think <clears throat> the thing about humans is we don't change, um, mm. we don't. The Neolithic people aren't that different to us. How they differ is largely in that, well, first of all, they don't have our knowledge and experience. They don't have that, you know, uh, they're, as, as the sort of pioneers of farmers, they don't have that long history of farm, farming behind them where they're able to say, yeah, you should do this and you shouldn't do this. Yeah, They're obviously watching for the signs for planting and all of that. Um, what were the other questions? I'm there was sorry. one where how they moved the rocks, like from if they're saying they're they're coming from whatever thirty five kilometers and some, you know, Wicklow, which is much much further. It could be maybe a hundred kilometers, I guess, probably, um, from that it's location. Asian east, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and they didn't have the proximity of water there. They didn't in some of those locations, from my my understanding anyway, which is old data, I'm, I'm sure. How would they have transported that? It would have taken them a very long time and an awful lot of effort to get them to this point. So going back to your original point, which you've kind of answered, it most likely had some sort of hierarchical structure there in society that dictated that you need to go and do this. This is your job to move these rocks. And they could be away for months at times, like, you know, so which probably it's another odd question on top of that. Like, how would they have discovered those rocks down in Wicklow? There would have been some sort of communication other settlements, other communities potentially down in that location. Yeah. Um, well, I think they're the first thing that we should realize about the Neolithic community who built the monuments of Bruna Bonia is they're a very mobile people. Yeah. Um, yes, they end up settled, but remember they've 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 emigrated across Europe from mm. the area of Turkey, which is a large part of Turkey that we would call Anatolia. That's, that's the sort of genetic origin of the Neolithic farmers. And actually, Ireland is the last place they arrived because, you know, 
migrated east, uh, westwards across Europe, eventually reaching the coasts. And then yeah. the thing is get into boats and come to the islands. So the very fact that they've gotten into boats, we think from France actually, uh, and arrived on in Western Ireland, indicates their mobility, you know. Mm. Um, um, so we also have this thing where, you know, the monuments of uh, Neolithic Ireland have similarities to Neolithic Britain. And it looks like there is s- such mobility that they're actually crossing the sea to participate. Mm. You know, some of them coming from Britain to Ireland and, 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 and vice versa. So there's that. Don't 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 ever assume that these are a people who, for whom seafaring is a challenge. Yeah. I think actually the you know Bob Quinn, who wrote the Atlantean, I had the pleasure of interviewing a few years ago. He says that he maintains we we learned to sail the oceans long before we saddled a horse, which I think was a very good way of saying yeah. yeah this, this is stuff we've known since time immemorial, you know. And uh, the large stones from Clare Head are interesting because if you're trying to quarry stones in the Neolithic, well, you have a challenge, which is how do you quarry stones when you don't have metal tools? Yeah. So uh, you use harder stones, apparently. Yeah. But uh, at Clare Head, where the two continents came together uh, 420 million years ago, Clare Head is the result of uh, the coming together. So I don't know your listeners may not know this um, and I didn't know this until about 10 or 15 years ago and I was totally blown away by it but there is a a, a, a suture they call it uh, a seam uh, running down from Clover Head down to the Shannon Estuary so uh, everything north of that and everything south of that were once upon a time located on different continents yeah. separated by an ocean called the Yapitus we call that the Yapitus Ocean and we call the seam or the suture the Yapitus Suture well, you see, the, 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 the sed- sedimentary rocks, the sandstones of Clare Head, uh, when the continents came together, were pushed upwards so that they, they're vertically formed. And basically, apparently, all the farmers had to do was go out there with wooden poles and nudge them or wedge them in between the cracks in the stones uh, and that way sort of break the stones off, get them onto the beach and either strap them to the underside of a, some sort of a barge mm-hmm. Or get them placed into some sort of a large dugout canoe, canoe, uh, which, to be honest, sounds quite hazardous. Uh, yeah, I think would have been hazardous. Well, a pretty big boat. Yeah, and this is the important thing, and this gives you, I, I suppose, an insight just into how resourceful these people were. Mm. Those stones weigh a minimum of one tons. Yeah. Some of them weigh seven, eight tons. I think maybe Huge. the largest stones at Newgrange might be as much as ten tons. Each of those is brought by boat down along the coast, up the river, deposited on the riverbank, and hauled up a kilometer from the river to Newgrange. Yeah. And there's 97 curbstones. There's probably 60 or 70 orthostats that form the passage walls and the chamber. Mm. And then there's another 100 or so stones. I think the total is between three and 400 large grey wacky slabs that form the major structure of Newgrange. Yeah. So you've got three or four hundred journeys up and down the river there. And all of those journeys have to take place, I think, at high tide. Certainly, you can't risk low tide because you might lose a stone. Um, <laughs> and, and even in, to that, so somebody might say, well, how do we know they didn't drag them across land? Well, the, how we know is we've no evidence for that, first of all. And secondly, it's, <laughs> you know, trust really? me, if you tried to drag something across land from Clara Head to the Boyd Valley, You've got immense challenges. You've got yeah. immense challenges in topography, in terms of rocky outcrops, in terms of streams and rivers that you have to cross. It's much easier just to put it in a boat and come down the the the, the along the coast and, and yeah. up the river, you know. And I actually wondered about the stones of Baltre, whether they weren't a signal, a signpost on that journey, because they're made from grey wax. It looks exactly like the stone. Uh, that that that's used. At I was going to say, is it a, is it a visible landmark of where we're at to start maybe change course? It it is. You see, it would be in that the sea was right up against the the bluff there at Baltre in the Neolithic, but the land that sort sort of there's much more land visible now between there and the sea that has been naturally reclaimed. And that's the location of the County Loud Golf Club. If every, anybody's ever yeah. played golf at Baltray at the County Loud Golf Club, that's all naturally reclaimed land. Uh, Frank Mitchell, the late great geologist, uh, he said that that was all thrown up 
in the interim that in the Neolithic, the coast, the sea came right up against the, the base of the bluff at Baltray. So it, it makes sense that close to the junction of sea and river, there'd be a, a waypoint, something up on the land. Oh yeah, we're coming to the river now, you know. Amazing. One of the one of the pieces, all of this seems to make complete sense when, when you're when you're saying, which is great. But um the the symbols that are on some of the rocks at Newgrange, when I was in Uluru um and I was visiting there with my wife before we had our first kid, we we connected with some local artists and one of the paintings that I bought had these spiral symbols and I was like, Hey, okay, well, job done on buying this one this this may, makes sense to me and i spoke to the artist and i said hey what what's the the symbolism between these spirals and he says oh well in the indigenous culture the spirals mean community and proximity to each other and um how we support each other and there's a river flowing through one of them and i was like obviously i'm making the connection back to my homeland which is what we're talking about here folks is it the same in the new grange, do you do you feel like those spirals are the symbolism for habitats? Are they are they guiding structures for the maps potentially with uh, where other communities might be in the in the area, such as Douth? Um, or am I taking it too literal? I'm inclined to think. Of course, look. Who knows. Megalithic art and the interpretation of megalithic art in Ireland is an area that is fraught with great uh, difficulty. You have to understand, we've no way of proving one way or the yeah. other. We come up with a, a, a myriad of theories, and there are literally hundreds of theories as to mm. what spiral, the triple spiral in particular of Newgrange, this one that I have around my neck, the triple spiral that is found on the chamber and on the oh, entrance yeah, yeah. stone. But I mean... I'm inclined to think because of the prominence of the spirals on the entrance stone and in the chamber where the sun goes in, that the spiral has some connection with the sun and the sunlight. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, it was Martin Brenham in his book, The Stars and the Stones, that pointed out that, well, actually, the spiral is a lovely representation of solar movement, the way the sun moves from solstice yeah. to solstice. Because in the winter, it's low, and in the summer, it's high. If you look at the arc of the sun in winter, where it rises and where it sets, it's a low arc. And then at the equinox, it's a bigger arc. And then at the summer solstice, it's a much bigger arc. But if you just follow that, imagine that you're following the sun beneath the horizon and from day to day, you're basically creating a spiral that's getting yeah. larger and larger as the sun moves higher in the sky. That so for sense. me, that would be the most obvious explanation of the mm. spiral, that solar movement. And then the fact that the sun deity Dagda is connected in the mythology with the monument. To me, that suggests that that's likely what it's about. Mm. Am I right? I don't Who know. Knows? Can I prove it? I don't know. Uh, someday we'll invent time travel. We'll go back in time and we'll try to communicate with the builders and say, listen, uh, we have this like, <laughs> you and Richard bad theory. Would you tell me whether it's true or not? You know, Bill and, and Ted. You, <laughs> you know, and you, yeah. Richard and you Anthony. Be, <laughs> you might be confronted with uh you know, a Neolithic builder. Party on! Yeah, you can just see the two of in a, in a, stone, a, a uh, you're telephone box. A bit wide in the mark there, buddy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so look, um, there's loads of stuff we, we, we can drive from it, but like you, you mentioned you've got five kids. Um, how do you convey the importance of these significant spaces um, in Ireland, like in their importance to our kind of current predicament like what what do you derive from all of the work that you and richard you know brilliantly have done what are the what are the key insights that you you kind of say well actually the this is what we can learn from from all this work uh well i suppose there's an idealist in me you know um there's a poet and a dreamer in me mm. that always thinks that one of these days any moment now uh, peace is going to break out amongst humankind. We're going to realize, yeah, we're destroying the planet. We're destroying each other. This is ridiculous. Yeah. We're going to sit down and work it all out. Um, so that's the idealist in me. Mm. Um, and there is a sense of, definitely, there has been in the work that I've done, and I've done some very poetic um, work, and some of what I've written has sort of verged into the area of spirituality and religion. 
I would say that it's very difficult to look back at all of that and not be moved by it mm. and not to feel the humanity behind it uh, and the awe behind it. And some of that is to do with, well, it's amazing what was achieved by people years ago before they had all this technology. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at all the technology we have, I think that it's likely that the people who built Newgrange would look at our environment uh, and judge us very harshly on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we pollute our rivers. We uh, pollute our atmosphere. We've caused the extinction of species. We've encouraged monoculture. We've wiped out habitats. Uh, we expand our own habitat with no regard, not just scant regard, but li literally with no regard yeah. for the other creatures with whom we share the planet. So you inevitably sort of get into reflecting on all of that. But then there is another side to that, which is, as I said earlier, the Neolithic people, were, I I don't think they were conservationists. Yeah. I, 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 I don't think that um, uh, sustainability was part of their Mind. mindset or their, their language, you know? I mean, it was literally survive, eat, survive, live this day out, live this week out, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they were dying of things that are eminently curable today. They had harsh lives. They, I mean, I said this on a, one of my own live streams recently and somebody criticized me for it. She said, oh, you know, I think, but it's the reality. If, yeah. you look at the, if you look at the ages of the, the people, the skeletons, the bone remains of the people who are buried in these tombs, and you've got everything from infants and young children and adolescents to young adults. I mean, nobody in the Neolithic so. seems to live very much beyond the age of 40, you know. Mm. So don't give, don't give me this crap about you know, oh, it's such a, a wonderful, peaceful era. And, you know, oh, it would have been so lovely. Don't romanticize about yeah. it, you know. Um, it would have been I a struggle. The biggest thing that we learn, I think, when we look into the past is we learn about our own humanity. We learn about our own flaws. Uh, we learn about our own uh, biases. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think when we look into the past, we see a reflection of modern man, modern woman. Um, but we've just take away a lot of the technology, take away a lot of the language development, you know, take away a lot of the way we do things. Um, I think ultimately that we all, if we were to go back in time and we were to live among these people for a while, and or conversely, if they were to come forward and live among us for that, I think, we would see one thing very clearly, and that is the shared common humanity. The fact that despite all our technology now and all the things that we know, <clears throat> we are still desperately ill-informed about what happens to the human being when the human being mortally dies. Yeah. So, and if there actually really is anything beyond yeah, uh, there's a lot of very interesting work. Uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, for instance, on you know um, life after death and other uh, people who've written about it. Um, I think that was the thing that preoccupied the builders of these monuments. They knew that their lives were fleetingly short, and they tried in their lifetime to create permanence in the monuments. They yeah. were literally, they literally created monuments that they thought would last forever. They thought, well, it's taken so much effort to put these together. There's something I wrote about in my book that's called Newgrange Monument to Immortality. And it was the idea of creating permanence in a fleeting life. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, like you think back to when you were in your 20s, right? You're, you're say your mid 20s. Yeah. For me... I was on the cusp of, I got married and I was just about to start having a family. Imagine in the Neolithic, that's when, that's when you're going to die. You know, yeah. that's, that's when that's even if you've managed to survive childbirth, which by the way, kills a lot of people in the Neolithic, both the yeah. mothers and the children, unfortunately, if you've managed to get through childhood into adolescence and finally you make it into adulthood, <laughs> that's it. 
game yeah. over. You know, this is the point of, in life when a lot of us are starting to think about, yeah, I think I might settle down. I think I might get married. I finally got my career going. Or you're maybe still thinking about your career. Well, back in the Neolithic, like, Lights that's out. just, sorry. You know, unless you're an outlier and you happen to survive into your 30s and maybe as far as 40, you yeah. know. Um, Here's a question for you. And, and, you know, as I said, we're probably coming towards the end of the, the arc here, but it's New Grange in particular. Um, we used to think it was two and a half thousand years before Christ. That's, you know, kind of a rough estimation, but I think it's increased now to maybe 4,000 years before Christ. Is that right? No, it's 3,000. It's actually very precisely dated now. Uh, we're quite precise. It's around 3200 to 3100 BC, that sort of time frame. So at that time when they created Newgrange, they didn't expect it to be kind of rediscovered, say, in the 1960s in Ireland. W what happened to that monument? Like, how, how do you feel um, that the monument and that civilization might have been somewhat forgotten about? Um, how do I feel about that? What's your knowledge about that space? Like as regards, how you know, did it? It is, it's really interesting. It, so it seems that the, the stones on the top of the cairn rolled down off the side and they covered everything, covered all the curb stones yeah. and the entrance. So nobody knew there was an inside or at least nobody was able to venture in there. So we've got Viking era graffiti inside and out where we don't have that at Newgrange. I believe Newgrange was sealed off for 4,000 years which is even right. more incredible when you consider in the 1960s that local people were telling the archaeologists the sun shines into the chamber there but they couldn't have seen that you know if the archaeologists are right about Newgrange the sun couldn't have been seen shining into the chamber for 4,000 years how, did, how does that knowledge get carried on which is one of the extraordinary one of the many extraordinary things about Newgrange but I think there's an interesting question there about how does it how does it remain sort of hidden and undiscovered yeah. for well a big part of the reason is to do with colonization and the arrival mm -hmm. of new people and that doesn't just start with the normans and the english by the way that starts literally uh, in the era in which uh, people are still using stone tools uh, the late neolithic because uh, there's an arrival of people who um we call them the beaker folk who begin for us a different age, which is the Bronze Age. Yeah. And within a couple of centuries, they're using bronze tools. They're, we now know they are a completely genetically diverse population to the Neolithic people. There are people, again, who've come across uh, Europe. This time, uh, they have different origins. They're, they're, they're from the steppe, the Pontic steppe that I mentioned earlier, the mm. steppe lands of what would be today southern Ukraine and parts of Russia. And uh, yeah, uh, I think colonization is important. The English, I mean, indigenous Irish people never forgot about their monuments. The stories about those monuments survived across vast timescales. Yeah. Uh, orally. We never wrote anything down yeah. because most Irish people couldn't write. You know, yeah. we didn't write. Remember, when writing arrived, it was the religious, it was the ecclesiastical scribes who wrote. The vast majority of Irish people never wrote until the 20th century. I mean, when you think about that, that most Irish stuff. people couldn't read or write uh, throughout Irish history. It was, only, it was only in the 20th century that people began to become literate. You only have to look at the census of, is it 1904? It's early 1900s. And you'll see under a lot of people's names, you know, um, that... The enumerator is the one that signs their signature for them mm -hmm. because they can't read or write. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think part of the reason that Newgrange remains hidden, as it were, is, believe it or not, to do with uh, uh, the, the antiquarians who wrote about Newgrange and other monuments. I'm talking about uh, in the centuries before the 20th century. So from the time Newgrange was discovered, uh, 1699, I, when I say discovered, just in case your listeners are confused, how does an enormous mound or cairn, of, uh, cairn uh, get lost? It doesn't. It's the yeah. interior of Newgrange that got lost. It, no, there was something inside it. 
Uh, that was rediscovered in 1699. If you look at the antiquarian writers, they cannot, the English ones in particular, the British ones, they can't get it into their heads that there were clever Irish men and clever yeah. Irish women in prehistory. So they always ascribe the building of these monuments to somebody else. The Danes, you know, as in the Vikings, which are much, 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 much later. And so that's part of it, you know. And then behind the scenes, quietly, this knowledge of the sun shining into Newgrange at a certain time of year gets preserved by people living in the area. Amazing, amazing stuff. Because I mean, they can't have seen that. They can't. They or their descendants, sorry, sorry, their ancestors. They can't have seen it in recent history because even if the front of Newgrange hadn't become covered with those tumble down stones, is that there's the fact that the compression of the, the Cairn material on the passage means that even if it had been cleared out, the sun would have been cut off. The sun couldn't yeah. have shone into the chamber of Newgrange. So, the people, so the people locally... Right knew about the fact that there was something there that the sun shone into that had carried through from centuries. Is that what we're saying? Read O'Kelly's book about Newgrange, Michael J. O'Kelly, who was the excavator of Newgrange, who uh, excavated Newgrange in the 60s and the 70s. If you read exactly what he says, he says that many people, not just one or two, many people told him about the sun shining into the chamber of Newgrange. And you're left with this marvellous mystery. I think it's part of the wonderful mystery of Newgrange. You're left with this thing that you have to contemplate, that that knowledge has literally survived since. Wow. The, not necessarily since in the immediate time that the monument was built, but since the time that it went into decay, which we yeah. think was at the end of the Neolithic and the beginning of the Bronze Age. Sometime, if we were to put strict figures on it, you'd be talking, they say roughly five centuries after Newgrange was built. So it could be any time from about 2700 to about 2400 BC is the era in which we think the tumble down happened and the monument got sealed up. Amazing oh, stuff. And here amazing. are people in the 1960s saying to the archaeologists, do you know that the sun is said to shine in there once a year? And, and it's impossible until the roof box is fully restored. Yeah. 1967. To know that. And O'Kelly became the first human since the Bronze Age to see the sun in the chamber of Newgrange. Amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. One one last question for you, because again, it's just a fascinating uh, kind of peek into your brain, uh, and I'm loving speaking about all this stuff. Um, around the uh, oh, my questions have popped out of my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, it's too much. No, no, no. What I was going to say. Oh, what was it? I'm going to look at my notes here. Oh, yeah. So a number of years ago, um. In 2018 or 2019, there was a, a pretty big drought in uh, in Ireland and around the surrounding areas. And I remember seeing, like you might have been on one of the newspapers around flying your drone around the back of Newgrange. And we could see the outline of what looks like another, um, you know, settlement of some sort. Tell us what you know about that. And has there been any further developments about excavation of that area? Well... No, not tell us what you know about that. Uh, as the discoverer, <laughs> I was the one who was Doors in there. Yes. <laughs> and that was um, Tuesday, the 10th of July, 2018. 2018. Uh, 8.47 p.m. in the evening, very right. precisely. Yeah. yeah, I was flying my drone. Um, it had become apparent that there had been a, a several, uh, well, actually a couple of months of drought. Uh, we hadn't had any rainfall in the Boyne Valley. And um, I started to see headlines in the British media the day before saying that there were sort of previously unknown monuments revealing themselves in the crops, in the yeah. crop marks. So I decided to fly over Brunabonia thinking, just thinking that some of the known monuments that we'd see aspects of those that we hadn't seen before. I, mm. I, I didn't expect to find any new, uh, new monuments, <laughs> new undiscovered monuments because Brunabonia is a very intensely studied landscape. It's yeah. archaeologists from all around the world have been studying it intensely for generations. So, um, yeah, I saw in a field uh, less, well, about 700 meters from Newgrange, there was this circular impression in the crop. It's a very large circle. Um, turns out it's about 150 meters in diameter. Or to put that in, in uh, feet, that's over 500 feet. Um, 
thought maybe for a moment that it was I thought stupidly that maybe a circus tent had been pitched there or something or I tried to sort of rationalize it in my head that maybe a tractor had driven around in, in a big circle but yeah. uh, when I got closer to it I could see that it had features that couldn't possibly be re- re- related to any of those things yeah. and I knew that I was looking at a crop mark and knowing the the, the landscape very well as somebody who studied the archaeology of Brunabonia for the past 20 years I, I knew there was no monument listed there you know yeah. uh, turns out and myself and Ken Williams who's another Drahada man who was uh, with me he also arrived and he had been flying his drone and I mentioned it to him I shouted out what the hell is that and he had a look um, it turns out we had discovered a late Neolithic henge uh, and a henge is probably probably a monument that uh, involved sort of think of like a stadium yeah think of a stadium where people are coming together to watch some sort of spectacle you know but just one of I mean we now know at Brunabonia there are at least 10 henges if not 12 it's the highest concentration of that type of monument anywhere in the world yeah uh, as a result of these discoveries but that discovery went worldwide I posted pictures that evening on Mythical Ireland on the Facebook page and by the next morning, they'd already gone viral and the phone started ringing and the local media were ringing. And then suddenly RTE wanted. And for the next three weeks, it went all around the world. It was on all the American channels and it was in the Washington Post and the New York Times. Wow. I have copies of those newspapers. It was in all the European channels. And then the Australians picked it up, South Africa. And uh, all of a sudden, then the Japanese uh, were featuring it on their uh, broadcasts. Um, so that's that was an amazing time. That was absolutely, uh, and all on a hunch, which was if I go there with the drone, I might see something. You know, the importance of experimentation, folks. You can see yeah. it in in evidence here. Has anything like has the OPW in Ireland? Has there been any kind of plans to dig a little bit into that area? No, and that's a question that everybody curiously wants to know about. Um, the simple answer is that it, it the monument is on Newgrange Farm. Newgrange Farm is mm-hmm. first and foremost a farm. Yeah. So, you know, they keep cattle and a lot of sheep, a yeah. uh, very limited amount of cattle, and they sow crops. Yeah. Uh, that field is currently under a crop of wheat, as it was in 2018 when it was discovered. Uh, but now Newgrange Farm, which consists of a large part of the land in front of Newgrange, between Newgrange and the river, a right. very substantial amount of that land is, first of all, it's the town land of Newgrange, but secondly, it's part of Newgrange Farm. Well, uh, Newgrange Farm and I have started working together. Uh, we're doing these tours. We started them last summer, but we're doing them again this summer, uh, where I basically tell people we go around on a specially modified tractor trailer yeah. and we go around the landscape and show people the monuments and tell them the archaeological significance, but also some of the myths and legends of nice. Newgrange Farm. Uh, there's been no digging precisely because it's on a private farm. Yeah. Uh, but that is the case for a huge amount of the Brunabonia monuments. Yeah. Huge, very little excavation has been done. Uh, and actually, broadly speaking, in the Irish landscape, probably 90% or so of, and probably higher than that, maybe 95% of all monuments, recorded monuments in Ireland, are on farmland. Yeah. So, so that brings its own challenges in regards to the, the preservation of these pieces or the exploration of them further. But at least we know they're there. That's the main thing. It's, well, it's, without excavation, we guess that it belongs yeah. to that late Neolithic. Uh, so that would be just in terms of time scale, that would be around 2500, sorry, 2900 BC to about 2500 BC. Yeah. Uh, that sort of period after the tombs have been built. Uh, but there's this new phase of activity in which we seem to be doing a lot more, shall we say, outdoor activity out in the open air in these large arena type monuments. What exactly was happening in there? We don't know, but I believe they're mentioned in mythology. They're called yeah. playing fields. Uh, literally a games plane is I how you would translate so. that. Uh, something so there like was that. something I'd say spectacular. Think about Gladiator uh, and sort of Croke Park of a Sunday afternoon. You know, Gaelic yeah. football with maybe a slightly violent edge. And I think we're probably close to what was happening in there, you know. <laughs> well, we're from the same area. We all know how crazy the people are around where, where we're from. So who knows what it is? Could have been absolutely anything. It could have been some of the, you know, the old students from St. Joseph's or St. Mary's having a having a football match. Who knows? Yeah. 
uh, beating the heads off each other. Yes. <laughs> Look, Anthony, I'm going to wrap up this. This has been absolutely, uh, I like the word illuminating at the moment. So I'm going to say that's what it was, but it's been brilliant to, to speak with you. Now, I know you're running tours um, in the summer months and you've started them back up. I was hoping to go a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and then I was like, it was, it was a birthday party on for one of my kids, not my my kids that I had to take them to. But I'm I'm going to be there in the next couple of ones that you run for sure. Um, I'm really excited about connecting with Richard and just learning more about this space that you're in. Is there uh, obviously your website? Uh, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. But is there a place where they can find out more about the upcoming tours? Well, the principal place, of course, is on the tours page of the website. So if you go to mythicalireland.com yeah. and you go to tours. Uh, the the next tour will always be advertised there, but also on the social media on yeah. Facebook in particular, the Facebook page. Uh, also on Facebook is the Mythical Ireland Community, yeah, uh, and on the Instagram. And I do have a Twitter, but I don't have a huge following on on X for some reason. Yeah. Um, so generally on the principally on the Facebook or Instagram. And Instagram, but the website, yeah, yeah I, because that's where the tickets are sold. So Absolutely. always on the website, first and foremost, on the tours page. Brilliant. I'll put a link to those in the show notes if you're listening on the podcast or if you're watching it on YouTube, it'll be in the description box. Anthony, listen, look, thanks so much for your time and hopefully we get to catch up for a coffee or something and I'll draw the next. Brilliant. I look forward to it. Yeah. Carrying on the conversation. Thanks for having me along. Absolutely. Absolutely.